Speaking on the Lord's Church is not a denomination, and I have no doubt that he'll be able to present that in a, a simple and powerful way that uh, each can understand exactly uh, why the church is not a denomination. So, Johnny, would you come speak to us? From time to time, when we travel to the UK, we make a little side trip, a little flight. It's about an hour flight or so over to Dublin. And we go over to the Chester Beatty Library, where there is one of the larger repositories of biblical manuscripts or parchments available for public view. Many of those are dated 150, 250 AD. Parts of Colossians, Romans, Acts, Paul's epistles, and of course some of John, and many others in the Old Testament. So on our last trip we went over there um, Bruce and Sue and another group of us, we all went together and real oddity about it was when we were returning, it looked to us, we couldn't say for absolute certainty, but it looked to us as if Brother Danny had another Bible. And I think he probably has it in his pocket and it is... Um, a rare find. It has to be somewhere in the 1 or 200 BC uh, period. We, we noticed it when he, he was preaching during one of the um, lectures and he dropped some of it on the floor and it scattered like parchment wood. You know, it, I mean, it wasn't a binding at all. So if you happen to ask him, He's got it. And I didn't really want to tell on you, Brother Danny, but... The pe huh? He, he has most of it. He has most of it. Uh, today we are looking at, again, another very serious topic that Brother uh, Brown has given us, the idea, of course, the Lord's Church is not a denomination. This is a topic that I am absolutely certain that you have spoken about with some friends at some point in your years of being Christians. What is it about the Lord's church? Many times they will refer to it as your church. What is it about your church that's so different? Why is it that you think you will be the only one saved? What is it about the church of Christ that makes you special? Uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit today and why it's not a denomination at all. Um, they will ask you something, perhaps, does your, they will phrase it, does your church, do they contribute to the pride parade? Do they, all these kinds of things that come up, the LG alphabet people, they will ask you about that. And I said, well, why not? Our, ch our church does, our group does. And, of course, you, you know, have to try to explain to them. And it's very difficult for them to understand what does the Bible teach as opposed to what they hear uh, amongst their groups. And I was talking with uh, someone today, and they were, they were discussing how in the world today you almost feel unsafe because people are so crazy. I said... I live in California. You don't, don't tell me about crazy people. <laughs> you have Nancy Pelosi telling the Pope what abortion is. So it's, and, and we have more, which ought to worry you, seriously. Um, but the idea uh, that we're looking at this, this afternoon, it's a very serious one. The Lord's Church is not a denomination. Uh, the Lord's Church and denominationalism are two 
totally different, opposite things. Uh, they have no two common uh, elements at all, not really. And want to look at some of the simple things that separate us. Denominations are divisions. Divisions are embraced by denominations. And that same mentality is one that we recently looked at in San Mateo when we were doing a, we were still doing a series of sermons from 1 Corinthians. And this mindset, this mentality is one, of course, that was rebuked and condemned by the Apostle Paul over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. I sh I'm sure that you're all familiar with this. But if you look at the seeds, or it may be not the seeds itself of denominationalism, you can certainly see the mentality of denominationalism uh, already in the onset with Corinth. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and these are the things that we'll talk about along the way that separate the church from denominationalism, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. And then he goes on to tell them that he had heard from someone from the household of Chloe that there are contentions among you. And that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And then Paul asks a very poignant and, and, and sober question, is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? <clears throat> and the problem in Corinth, of course, was that the, the brethren were dividing based on their allegiance to personalities and affinity for certain individuals. We look at denominations today and... They exist because people are divided based on their allegiance to uh, particular groups or an affinity for certain doctrines or practices. Uh, doctrine is probably a too strong a word because denominationalism doesn't really delve too deeply with doctrine. Uh, many of those people who are in denominations, they don't really pay that much attention to what the denomination teaches really, and they, and they change, they switch denominations pretty regularly or frequently. The problem is denominations still exist. Divisions still exist. And contrary to the acceptance of division present among denominations, Jesus prayed for unity. So division, we'll get to that word. Denomination, we'll get to that word. But Jesus prayed for unity, which is the exact opposite of these things. Again, you go over to the book of John, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those, who, for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may, again, all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, one in us, so that the world may believe or know that you sent me. <clears throat> so the whole foundation upon which division or denominationalism is premise is in complete and total contrast and opposition to what Jesus prays for in John 17. This unity of the spirit, uh, Ephesians 4 verse 3, that's not created or maintained by ignoring differences on matters of faith but by all speaking the same thing. 1 Corinthians 1.10 Division does not come when people are standing together for the truth, but when people depart from the truth. And so the, blames that division belong, uh, the blame for that division belongs to the denominations who have departed from the truth, divides those who are allegedly part of the body of Christ. That's in Jude 1, verses 17 through 19. We have to say then that the Lord's church can only be described in divine terms. It is a divine body, an organism uh, consisting of individual elements that make up a living temple of God. And it's especially different for people in the modern society today because they think about the denominational concept of the church and how it is in their mind 
something that is tolerant and accepting of sin and immorality. And in the world today, and it is something to be quite uh, quite concerned about, in the world today, and especially in our country today, there is the expectation that religion will bend to the cultural trends. That religion will bend toward immorality, to be tolerant of immorality, accepting, and to change so that it is in conformity with immorality. Now the great thrust in the country today is immorality. It is a part of those movements, the trans movement, the LGB alphabet movements. It goes all toward conforming to their agendas. The denominational world has accepted that, has embraced it. It enlarges their numbers. It takes the heat off of them. But the church is not a denomination. And every member of the church has to be in fierce opposition to that agenda. Not quietly in opposition, but fervently and vocally in opposition, regardless of the consequences. Some years ago, the congregation here, and again, that point that was made by Brother Danny, uh, two great outstanding elderships, very few in the country these days and fewer still that will stand for the truth. So we're blessed in that way this, this afternoon. But the Spring Congregation, some years ago, they published a book titled The Church Versus Denominations. I, and I'm sure that some of you probably still have copies of that. And it took a look at the beginning of various groups that teach error with regard to the scriptures. Those who were the leaders and founders of various denominational groups and the missteps that they all took away from the truth. So what we know from the scriptures is Jesus does save. There can be no doubt of that. Whom does he save and how does he save? And that, of course, meaning saving from death, the death of sin, and, of course, from eternal punishment. Ephesians 5.23 tells us he is the savior of the body. So what are some differences between the church and denominationalism? What are the things that distinguish or, to use a term, I have to give you this term. The term is demarcation. And that term came to light when Brother Bruce was sitting on on the tube in England. And he decided he would just spread out. And the older gentleman next to Bruce, he said, demarcation, stay on your side. Bruce gave him a funny look, but but there's a difference, and and we have to understand, and this is something very important for the, the New Testament Christian, the member of the Church of Christ, to know there is a difference between the church and denominations. There are people... I've heard in the church who don't know those differences. They will say of denominational groups that these are Christians. They're not. If they haven't been baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, they are not members of the body of Christ. They're not New Testament Christians. Well, what are some of the differences? The difference we'll begin with is the difference of origin. The Lord's church originated in the mind of God. We've already said this before the foundation of the world. Paul wrote to the Ephesians about this, unto me who am less than the least of all saints. We read this this morning, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Was this grace given to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all men see what's the dispensation of the mystery, which for ages had been hid in God who created all things? 
to the intent that now to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. So we see the difference in origin right here. Uh, up until the time of about 606 AD, denominationalism was essentially non-existent. Uh, none really existed formally uh, until the Roman emperor conferred on a man named Boniface uh, III the title of universal father. That was the beginning of all of this. Catholicism, the first modern-day denomination, had its origin in Rome 606. Now, after that, of course, we had the Protestant Reformation. They broke with Catholicism in the early 1500s, and the Protestant variety of religious organizations was born. The church of Christ is different. It's not any part of the denominational movement in any respect. The church is not a denomination. It's not a part of the denominational movement. It has no relationship to denominations at all. And the difference is that men started denominations. God started the church. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Psalm 127.1. And so the church of Christ, that's the Lord's church. Then again, this goes to Matthew 16.18, but you think about the various religious organizations. That's pretty much the way I describe them, religious organizations. There are, of course, you think of the Mormons. How did that start? Who started it? The Jehovah Witness, how did that start? Who started it? Christian Science, how did that start? Who started it? None of those have a biblical basis of origin. We also see who is the head of the church, which all of you, of course, know, Ephesians 1, 22, 23. He is the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Colossians 1, 18, 19, he is the head of the body, the church. Synonyms, the church and his body. So we see a difference in origin. The church emanated from the mind of God, Denominations emanate from the mind of men. There's a difference in purpose. The purpose of the church, of course, is to preach and teach the gospel. Brother Danny gave that information really well. Sometimes people are unclear on what the purpose of the church is. The church seeks and saves, uh, preaches the gospel to save the lost. That is our foremost responsibility. There are other aspects of church work, benevolence, and so forth. But the primary purpose is to preach and teach the gospel. What is the primary purpose of denominations? To send people in the wrong direction. To move people away from the work and worship and fellowship with God to lure people away from the truth, to engage people with entertainment and things that will take their minds off of God. Now those who hear the, the saving message that's preached by the church of Christ and obey it from the heart, they are promised salvation from past sins. Acts 2.38, Mark 16, 15 and 16. That person who obeys that form of doctrine is automatically becomes a part of the church. Added to that church, added to the church by the Lord himself. You think about the denominational world and how people, I'll come back to this later, but how do people become part of denominations? They are voted on by a council or a group or they have to go through various mechanisms to, you know, these prayers and, and all of these things. This is something that, again, separates the church, which is a beautiful institution brought into existence by God, or an institution brought into existence by a guy, for instance, who looks inside of a hat that has two stones. Let's look at a few passages that speak to the importance, again, of the church. It being one body, not many. One organization, not divided. Romans chapter 12. 
In Romans chapter 12, Paul writes there, he says for, in verse, beginning in verse 4, for as, many, for as we have many members in one body, and remember, and again, the body is the church, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as the body is one and half many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. It's very difficult for people who believe in denominationalism to accept. But the Bible speaks it in very clear terms. It's not very difficult to understand. Ephesians chapter 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Examples of one baptism. As an example, you recall in Acts chapter 19, when Paul came across those disciples and they had only known of the baptism of John. And so Paul preached the gospel to them, taught them, and then he baptized them into Christ for the remission of their sins. He did not let them, as in many denominational groups today, he did not just accept whatever quote-unquote baptism they had received earlier, which was not a baptism at all because the Bible says there's only one baptism. And so he baptized them into Christ for the remission of sin. Unto what then were you baptized? Now, I'll come back around to that point because that's another critical point. <clears throat> because some people, and even some that have been members of the body of Christ, have accepted the quote-unquote baptism of denominational groups, saying that they would not rebaptize them. But a person, if a person has not been baptized into Christ for the remission of sin with the understanding and knowledge that they are being added to the Lord's church, then what, going back to Paul's question, unto what then were you baptized? Well, I was baptized uh, as a Methodist or a Presbyterian. Well, there is inherently a problem with that, isn't it? If they're not baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, that eliminates a lot of groups right there. Understanding that that, bapt that baptism allows them to be a part of the church of Christ, the church for which Christ died, then they are not New Testament Christians. Now, this is not an easy thing to talk to someone about, and people will get upset and maybe even angry when you talk to them about this. But people have to understand clearly that when they are being baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, they are being baptized into the Lord's church, not to some other uh, religious group. There is a difference in worship. When we talk about differences in worship, we are told in the scriptures that the early Christians assembled themselves together on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. The disciples came together to break bread we understand this also, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, the purpose of the communal supper, all of these things to give of the means, but we'll talk about this. The first thing that is very different is the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Now, that's different from denominationalism right there. Many denominations, they maybe they have what they call communion, maybe quarterly, maybe on holidays, different, different times, different days. I've even seen places that have it on Thursdays. The Lord's church in their worship, the communion with the Lord, the Lord's Supper, every first day of the week. And there's a certain decorum and proper order about that. But that's one of the things that we, we see that's different from denominations uh, from the very beginning. The Lord taught the disciples to pray 
Matthew 6 and 5 and following. And we ask ourselves, how different is that? How different is that from denominations? How different is that from the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the Methodists? Do they have the communion every first day of the week? And if you ask one of the people who are associated with those groups, why not? They likely won't be able to give you an answer. But you show them what the Bible teaches. Ask them why is it that they depart from that particular scriptural reference and see what, they're, well, see what they say. We also know that there was prayer. Again, Matthew 6, 5. On the Lord's day, there was the preaching of the word. Acts chapter 20, verse 7 and following. Disciples came together on the first day of the week there. Paul taught the brethren continuous communication for a long time. Not, Brother Danny, until midnight. I know you were itching for that. There's also the uh, engagement of early church singing, Ephesians 5.19, corporate nature of, of, of music, not with mechanical instruments. Uh, one of the things that we learned when we were on one of the trips with Brother Keith uh, many years ago in the UK before his passing as we went to various places that had been formerly Churches of Christ, a number of buildings that had been Church of Christ buildings, but had since been taken over by denominational groups, and they had, you could see where they had brought in and put in the various mechanical instruments, organs and, and so forth. I almost made you cry when you think a few hundred years ago, this was indeed a flourishing Church of Christ. And now it's taken over by a denominational group, preaching error, sending people to eternal punishment. And those are the things, again, to recognize seriously, to think about what happens to people's souls when they go into the uh, arena of denominational teaching. They find themselves on a fast track to eternal punishment. It is our responsibility, every one of us, to the people that we know, to our friends, our relatives, the people we work with, our neighbors, the people that we share, I don't know, tomatoes with. The Lord's Church is not a denomination. It's something really different in so many different ways. But we think about how the various denominational groups, and even, I guess I would have to categorize Jeff Walling as a denominational group. I know at one time, Jeff Walling, when he would speak, would have people on stage, and they would be drawing a picture of what he was speaking about, the biblical scene. They'd be painting it while he was preaching. And off stage, someone would be playing some instrument. Uh, in that way, he was saying that they didn't use a musical instrument to worship but because it was off stage. But you have all sorts of ways that People look for entertainment. The church is not a place for entertainment. If you come here for entertainment, you've come to the wrong place. You should come to hear the gospel of Christ. You should come to hear about eternal salvation. <clears throat> you should come to learn about what you need to do in order to be saved. Because if you're here today and not a Christian, you should think very seriously about how you might become one. We've had people leave our congregation because they were looking for entertainment. We've had people leave because we weren't giving away hot dogs. We've had people leave for all sorts of reasons, but the people who stay, stay because they have a love for the truth. The Lord's church is different. The early church, the first day of the week, contributing to the, com the common congregational treasury. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now here is where the church differs from denominations in a big way. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you came up in, in denominational groups, but when I was younger, we used to visit denominational groups, and, and we even, my family, belonged to a denomination. And one of the things I never forgot when I was younger was how often 
the contribution plate was passed. <clears throat> and especially, I remember, <clears throat> it was passed two or three times. And when it was passed the third time, they, as they call him the pastor, they call him that errantly. He said, well, and this time when we pass the contribution, we don't want to hear any change. Now, what does that tell us about spiritual matters? What does that tell us about being spiritual minded? It tells us that this whole operation, it generally is a religious scam. The whole idea behind it is what? Money. The church contributes to the work that they are engaged in. They are responsible, responsible for supporting that work, supporting the preacher and his wife, if possible, supporting elders. I heard once from uh, one brother, he said that if the members of the body actually contributed 10%, church would never have financial difficulties. The Lord's church is different in worship, different in the communion, different in praying in terms of our prayers to God, different in terms of our preaching the word of God, uh, different in terms of singing, different in terms of contributing, different in organization. Organization of church is not like the organization of uh, the denominational world. Just think about it. In the church, we have primarily elders and deacons. Paul, when he wrote to the church in Philippi, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus that are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. It's a simple, complete organization. <clears throat> the elders oversee, not the Pope, not the Baptist pastor, <clears throat> the elders, the qualifications of which are given in the scriptures, and they have the obligation and responsibility to oversee the congregation in all matters. Now, some people say, well, let's divide that up into certain matters, only in spiritual matters. But the responsibility of the elders is one that is far reaching. And in the church, it extends in ways we won't talk about today, but it extends into uh, matters that would have to do with the church budget. You know, elders need to know how to budget for the church work. And so this is something that uh, oftentimes people don't want to talk about. But the elders have to talk about it. The church is different from denominations in membership. And in membership in this particular way. In order to be a member of the Church of Christ, in order to be a member of the Lord's Church, a person has to obey the pure gospel of Christ. That form of doctrine, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. When, and use that term, alien sinner does that, the Lord adds that person to his church. No one can join the church of Christ. You can go into a religious organization and you can tell them you'd like to join. If you have enough money, that won't be a problem. But you can't do that with the church. With the church, the Lord has to add us to the church. And he adds us to the church when we obey the gospel. And that is how the church grows. You obey the gospel, save your member because the Lord has added you, and people 
We think about how people in the, in the religious world, they change from group to group. We did that when I was young. When I grew up as a younger person, my family was a part of a Baptist group. And we moved across town and we became Episcopalians. That wasn't even hard. We just went across town and went to another place and that was okay, that was all right. In the church, there, it's, it's a little more complicated but not so much as, but in the church, you're added by the Lord. You go from one city to the next, you're gonna meet some brethren and they're gonna ask you about different things to make sure that you are sound. They're going to ask you about certain things to make sure that perhaps you have a right to be married. They're going to ask you about those. That's why the church is different. The church is not a denomination. It's something that we have to take very seriously. We have to think about very seriously. We have to understand what the responsibilities of the individual members are and the responsibilities that we have to the leadership and the responsibilities that we have to the Lord. Those are the things that make it different. If you belong to a religious organization, a denomination, you have no responsibility to anyone, really. One, because you're not authorized by the Lord to begin with. Secondly, because people pretty much do what they please. The terms of memberships and denominations is just the opposite of what it is in the Lord's church. You can become a member of a denomination, just walk right in, put your money, your money in the basket, and you'll be added to the membership. Last thing that we want to mention before um, we end in a minute or two. Uh, the Lord's church is not a denomination. It's autonomous. And it is without any denominational oversight. There's no hierarchy. There's, you probably had someone ask you, where is your headquarters? Well, your headquarters is in heaven. It's not in Chicago. It's not in Brooklyn. It's not in any of those places. It doesn't have any formal creeds or informal doctrinal statements or statements of faith. Local governance is a plurality of elders, not one elder over several congregations, which is one of the things that started the church to go off the, in, the, in the first place. Baptism by consent, he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, this is one point, I won't, I won't labor this, but baptism is a big difference between the church and denominations. We don't touch people on the forehead, we don't dip them in water, we don't give them roses, we don't do any of those things. They are baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, completely, totally baptized for the remission of sin. Weekly observance of the Lord's Supper, a cappella singing, scriptural name, Romans 16, 16. Those are some of the basic differences between the church, which is not a denomination, and those that are.